critically important official, particularly in states where there are debates over voting rights. And state legislatures are the ones who uh, pass voting laws most frequently uh, and also draw political districts, but people usually never think about who their state rep is. Uh, and then people don't focus on these races enough, but also these elections are also held often at very strange times. Like in New York City, we had three different primaries for local elections in the past election. And like even one primary would have low turnout, but like three different primaries is guaranteed to have low turnout. Because how many people are gonna research every different primary are gonna go out and vote three different primaries? And I know I only voted um, in one of them and I follow this stuff for a living. And so what they did in Georgia was there was a huge election in Georgia for governor, a lot of people paid attention, and basically if the election was close, if you didn't get a majority, it went to a runoff. Well, the runoff took place uh, because the election in, in Georgia was kind of drawn out. The election took place on December 4th, which was like um, about, about a month after the election. And at that point, everyone in Georgia had election. Uh, and a lot of people were unhappy about the voting process. Um, a lot of African-American voters in particular felt like the election was stolen uh, from the Democrat Stacey Abrams. Uh, and they weren't that motivated to go out and vote again. They weren't that motivated to vote again after they had just stood in four-hour lines, or they had maybe been purged from the voting rolls, or they had heard stories about who people who were purged. And election day was not a smooth process for many Georgians. Um, but the reason why we have these runoff elections, the reason why we have these runoff elections uh, in December, in December 4th, uh, was that this was something that was done by Southern Democrats, back when Southern Democrats controlled the South try to keep voter turnout low. And then the Southern Democrats got rid of it. Then the Georgia Republicans, the people who used to be Southern Democrats and who became Republicans, brought this back. Because they know that if you're in a conservative state like Georgia, uh, that uh, if you just have a low turnout election, the typical folks vote, uh, that that's going to benefit Republicans. And that's what we saw in the Secretary of State race, that uh, the Georgia, despite having a very contested gubernatorial election, just elected a candidate uh, who basically vowed to continue the policies of the previous Secretary of State, which led to such a disputed election. But the thing that I disagree with you with is that I think voting rights were mobilizing issues in a lot of states. If you look at Florida, for example, the fact that Florida elected a Republican senator and a Republican governor, but voted 65% to restore voting rights to ex felons which is thought of as a liberal issue, even though it shouldn't be, as your work suggests, but it's thought of as this you know, liberal issue, uh, soft on crime, all of this stuff. But you have a lot of people who pull the lever for you know, tough on crime, law and order, Republican candidates also voted to give people second chances. Um, and the fact that in every state where there was a ballot initiative to make it easier to vote, it passed, I think is really, really important. I think it shows uh, broad support for voting rights in this country. Um, but I also think that you have to connect voting rights to other issues, and you have to have messengers that are appealing. And I think, you know, when Stacey Abrams talked about voting rights and was running to become the first black woman governor of U.S. history, that had resonance. Um, when John Farrell, the Democratic Secretary of State, who was an old white guy, talked about it, wasn't quite as consequential. Um, people didn't really um, see the connections as much. So I'm not sure how much we can infer from a, a, a low turnout election um, in Georgia, but, but I am hopeful that voting rights is becoming a bigger issue. I know, just from my own coverage, um, the amount of coverage these issues are getting now in 2018 versus the amount of coverage they got when I started covering this in 2011 is, is much, much greater. People are much more engaged. I think people see the connection between what's happening to our voting laws, what's happening to the mechanisms of our democracy, and then what's happening in the political system. I can turn over the floor if there's any guests uh, here who have, uh, I'm sure, have lots of thoughts and questions. So let's open it up and, and get, some, get some feedback from the room. Yes. Turnout 
in um, elections. And okay, because a lot of people think that only the presidential election is important, but don't realize the local elections for the governor and mayor is just as important, in fact, actually more important than the, you know, than the presidential election. So, I, so what do you think needs to be done to educate, you know, our, our voters more and, and, and tackle issues that, you know, that, that the livelihoods I just connected to the vote? I, I always hesitate to endorse any proposal that puts more duties and responsibilities on our public school teachers. From my point of view, they have way too much to do already, and we often put society's gravest concerns on them. Um, I think it's all of our responsibilities and every institution's responsibility. But in terms of the notion of whether we do civics education right or wrong, I'm not sure <laughs> in my lifetime we've ever had civics education. People have been saying this as long as I can remember, right? Um, that we don't do civics education right. Well, fine, but like in India, there's 90% voter turnout in every election, and <laughs> half the people don't go to school at all. And 70% of girls don't go to school at all. So it, there's no direct correlation between whether people vote and whether they get whatever in school. But well, it is a, not, in, in the US, that's not true, though. In the US, and, and Mark, you probably say this, in the US, education is a predictor yes. of voter turnout. Right. That, that people who uh, have PhDs are a lot more likely to vote than people who didn't go to high Isn't school. Isn't that essentially family income and voter turnout? I think education is a better predictor. Well, I think they're both indicators, and I think there's a lot of overlap between income and education, but I think it would stand a reason that you know, the, if you're more educated, you're more likely to vote, at least in this country, and if you had more civics education, if you think knowledge is power, you'd be more likely to go out and vote and then do things beyond voting as well. Mark, what is the what does the literature say? I mean, I think if you want to predict voting, if you're giving one variable in the U.S. to know, if I want to know your education level or your age, I'm going to those two things would be the two most useful things to know. Um, I, I do think it's the case that a lot of that's probably correlational. It's not the educational experience, but all the things that you'd like to come that get bundled into it, there's probably some additional effect of education and probably some, for the question, some additional effect of the civics education. That is probably not the overriding uh, feature, but it's still, I think, is an important, an important thing. I would, I would suggest the U.S. is the outlier in this, and as in most things. Uh, yes. Hello. So you guys mentioned that there was a lot of voter suppression in the past few elections with things like you know, felons were unable to vote, and you talked about that poor girl who said she wasn't a citizen and things like that. So what restrictions on voting do you think are necessary? Do you, if I mean, or do you think that you know if you're able to go to the polls, do you think you should be able to vote? I mean, we we are we already have a lot of restrictions on voting. I mean, you already have to be uh, 18 years old, you have to be a resident of the state, uh, you have to, uh, in certain places, you know, not have committed a crime. We, we already have restrictions on voting that other countries don't have. In most democracies, prisoners can vote. People never lose their right to vote because voting is viewed as part of a rehabilitation process. And therefore, why would you take away something that's essential to people's rights if you want them to come out as full citizens? We don't do that here. Um, in, in, a, in a lot of, in some countries, voting is mandatory, like Australia. We don't do that here. In a lot of other countries, uh, you would never have a partisan election official overseeing an election and then also running for office. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have one of the things, let alone both of those dynamics. So, I mean, I think the U.S. is an outlier, um, but I think if basically, you know, you can prove some very basic information that you're of voting age, that you're a citizen, that you're a resident, I think that's enough. I don't think we need anything more than that. I think we already have systems in place to check for all of those things. There is a student question about the um, electoral college that I think kind of relates here. Is that student in, in the room right now? Kathy, can you, can you read the question? Do you sure. Have it? sure. Um, I'm trying to think who was, who was it. Um, I think it was Javier. Javier, yeah. Javier is here. Javier, do you want to ask your question? Regarding Mary's 
Regarding the Ari Berman article, could changing the Electoral College to a choice uh, rank voting system alleviate the problem of a vulnerable structure that is prone to sabotage? I think why I thought this might be relevant uh, for now is you know, one feature of the Electoral College system is you just try to win your state. But one thing that would change if you move to a different voting feature where maybe you're aggregating up votes is that just winning your state wouldn't be enough, and you want to maximize your your state's number of votes that they're getting in there. It might incentivize uh, just sort of statewide turnout more than uh, if you're you know if you're in Mississippi, you're just trying to you know make sure the Republican stays ahead instead of maximizing uh, Republican votes. But, yeah. We're not talking about a popular vote system. I, I, mean, I, I was thinking more like are there different is, is the electoral college or our voting system in some way that's causing um, places to put these restrictions on? I mean, um. Maybe, but the thing is, is there's the state officials are also worried about their own races. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, they're worried about the governor's race and the secretary of state race and the state legislative races. So, I mean, even if you had a different electoral college system, they're still going to be worried about their own power. I mean, I think they're chiefly passing these laws because they're worried about their own power. Um, and then, secondarily, um, the president. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in, in kind of unusual ideas to try to reform the electoral system. Um, like in Maine, for example, now they have instant runoff voting. So in, if the election in Georgia had been done under the, the Maine system, basically whoever was like the second preference, they would run the election again if it was close, and whoever was the second preference, those votes would go um, to the other candidate, and then you wouldn't need to have a runoff. And you would essentially decide this thing, and that's a more democratic system than having uh, a low turnout runoff. But I mean, I think broadly speaking, um, I think it's great in Pennsylvania that the candidates always come here. Um, but I think if you're a, a Republican in uh, New York or you're a Democrat in Texas, uh, you're not getting a whole lot of attention. The presidential election is always decided um, we'll by, by 10 states. We'll, well maybe Texas, but <laughs> put it this way. If you're a Democrat in Wyoming, the presidential candidate is never going to get you. Yes, in the middle? Yeah. Hi. So um, with the midterm elections that just passed, I've been thinking a lot about how at least on college campuses, it seems like people are getting much more interested in politics. And a lot of this has been in the form of various actions on social media. And you were saying earlier that Facebook is very good at getting people together to do something, but not very good at getting us to think about further implications. So do you have something to say about perhaps that some of the new interest in politics is like misled, or in some ways we're doing more harm than no, I would never go that far, no. <laughs> but I think it's insufficient, right? It's insufficient to be motivated and organized and not be deliberative, right? Deliberation is what's supposed to happen in the um, 20 months leading up to a statewide election or you know, 36 months leading up to a presidential election, right? Or, or just every day, right? As we think about what to do with uh, solid waste in our communities, whether to build a new water treatment plant, whether to raise school taxes, that level of deliberation, we have to strengthen the institutions that let that happen, right? Um, again, not to say we ever had a golden age, but um, we know the institutions that allow us to deliberate that way. They include journalism, uh, healthy, well-funded, well responsible, professional journalism fosters civic and public deliberation. Um, when done right, for a number of reasons, the practice of journalism has distort, been distorted over the last few decades, um, and I think that we need some interventions that can refund uh, journalism in more creative ways, and we can talk about that some other time. Uh, beyond that, I think the public library is the crucial institution that needs to be refunded fully. I think that is uh, the, the temple to the Enlightenment in the good sense, and, uh, and, and the public library is the place where communities can gather and deliberate and sort through disparate claims and uh, get sources of good information with some professional guidance. Um, you know, they are, they're, they're quiet, non-commercially marked spaces um, where um, citizens are respected. And, uh, um, and they're genius and they're beautiful and we should fund them better and keep them open later. Uh, but instead of the last 40 years, we've done the opposite. So at the exact moment that we've built a media ecosystem designed to distract us and undermine our ability to think clearly, we have defunded the very institutions, public schools, public universities, libraries, um, town halls, uh, 
that, that could actually help us think better. Thank you for your presentations. I had a question for Ari about why do you think voter suppression happened when it happened? You said that, that in 24 states since 2010 yeah. there's been some suppression. Ziva suggests maybe we go back to 2001 as the turning point. Why wasn't this happening as much, let's say, in the 1990s? What changed? Well, I would say with regards to the recent proliferation of laws, it was clearly a response to the election of the first black president. I mean, there's just there's just absolutely no doubt about that. Uh, that what happened in 2008 was not only was Barack Obama elected president, but there were five million new voters that cast a ballot. And of those five million new voters, two million were Latino, two million were African American, 750,000 were Asian American. So virtually all the vote in the electorate was for voters of color. And they voted 75% for President Obama. And this demographic shift, which was called the Coalition of the Ascent uh, by some political observers, set off alarm bells within the Republican Party. And they really had two options. They could either try to change or moderate their policies, which was impossible because of the influence of the Tea Party, or uh, they could go back to a very old strategy uh, in American politics, which is you try to prevent people that disagree with you from voting in the first place. I mean, this is a tried and true tactic uh, in the Jim Crow years and even before. And I mean, we had seen some of these efforts post 2000. I mean, we had seen the beginnings of voter ID laws and the beginning of a lot of rhetoric about voter fraud. And in the Bush administration, we saw U.S. attorneys fired for not trying to prosecute bogus voter fraud cases. We had saw, seen some of these efforts start happening, but I mean, they, we, had, we saw a massive escalation of the strategy once Republicans took power. I think basically said, they, they figured out, you know, if Barack Obama was gonna be in the White House, they were gonna control the states, and they were gonna make the states their battlegrounds. And uh, that was how they were gonna elect a different kind of president. And that failed in 2012, partly because uh, there were a lot of these laws were blocked in court. There was also a backlash that Obama's campaign did a really effective job in organizing against these efforts. But in 2016, without having a, uh, an African American candidate on the ballot, uh, with dampened enthusiasm for Hillary Clinton, these restrictions had an impact. They had an impact in states like Wisconsin. Uh, and in 2018, um, they got more intense in certain places because there were um, new laws in effect, and there were also states that hadn't been competitive in the past like Georgia and North Dakota, where there were suddenly competitive elections. And I think uh, people were really worried that they were going to lose, you know, not just in the swing states, but in some of the red states as well. And so the, the efforts um, got more egregious. But I think this is all driven um, by the changing demographics of the country. Uh, and I, my fear is that this is going to become more frequent um, as the demographics of the country change. And just in the same way that you know, after Reconstruction, we saw a massive power shift in the South, people resorted to more and more aggressive tactics. I don't think we're going to see, this, hopefully, you know, the, the same level of things done now that we're done then, but we're seeing a different version of the old strategy. I, I would, if I were to write this story like a, in a book or a magazine article, I would actually focus on Texas. I was a reporter in Texas in the 1980s and 90s, uh, and during the administrations of uh, Bill Clements, who was the a Republican, uh, actually the first Republican elected governor in Texas after Reconstruction, um, it was a second term. He had lost his first term and then come back, um, uh, Cleveland style, and uh, and then and Richards. Uh, and during those years, when Clements was governor, his Secretary of State, a guy named Jack Fields, uh, launched a massive voter registration effort. Uh, and they put voter registration cards with every dr driver's license renewal mail out. They they had people invited to register to vote when they got their driver's licenses. They went out to high schools when graduating students turned 18. Like a Republican administration was pushing voter registration and pushing for higher voter turnout, right? It was this sort of celebration of, of Texas rising. And one of the reasons was they wanted to have more votes in a presidential primary, I'm sorry, in a presidential general election, a more total number of votes in the presidential general election. This is wonky stuff. Um, in, for instance, 1988, when George H.W. Bush was running, or 1992, when he ran for re-election, the strategy of the Republicans was pump up the total number of votes for George H.W. Bush in a presidential year, because the following Republican convention after that, the delegates would be determined by the number of Republican votes for the, the previous president. 
Again, as I said, went wonky stuff. The idea was in Karl Rove's head that younger Bush, George W. Bush, would run eventually, and the best way to make sure he got the nomination was to maximize the number of Texas delegates in whatever Republican convention came after that. So this is long game, but there was more than that because Karl Rove, the real brain behind the growth of the Texas Republican Party, firmly believed that Latinos in Texas would swing right and would stop voting for Democrats if given enough George W. Bush to vote for. And George W. Bush got something like 48% of the Latino vote the first time he ran. Actually, I think that was the second time he ran. The first time he ran, he only got 40%. Um, but that was like a record. And Rove saw the potential of locking that vote in uh, in perpetuity and knowing that that was the big area of growth in Texas. He figured Texas would be Republican for 50 years if he could nail that down. So he attracted a lot of high-level Latino candidates to switch parties. Um, and that all changed when Bush became president, when George W. Bush became president and Rick Perry became governor because Rick Perry had no such appeal and knew that he couldn't win Latino votes. And so he and his political operatives went for the very strategy that Ari has tracked around the world. And that became the model. And Perry's success, electoral success, then became a much more demonstrable, data-driven model of very carefully turning out your vote and suppressing the other vote. Um, one, of the two, one of the four times Rick Perry ran for governor, he ran against a Latino candidate, Tony Sanchez, and he crushed him. And yet Sanchez still pulled in quite a, a vast majority of Latino votes. But the vote turnout was so suppressed for a variety of reasons. And that just shows, like, proof of concept. The Rick Perry model was the way of the future for the Republicans. Quick, quick comment before the question. I agree with all the reasons why we see this uptick in a, a manipulation. I would just add to the um, list the opportunity that we had such an atypical level of legislatures and governorships held by the same party. Yeah, so it allowed an extraordinary um, growth industry and election reform manipulation. Um, my question, a big concern I've been having is about election integrity and voter faith in elections that exact, actually deserve the faith. I worry that this problem is going to grow, that the yeah. technology on the rise is going to make it worse. Um, and this, I think, is something qualitatively new, um, not the post-2000 phenomenon, but really the last few years. I wonder if either one of the speakers or anyone have um, good ideas about how to give a voters and maybe a hardcore base of the Trump voters, but voters who distrust an election result. What could we do to tell them we have a common factual reality you can trust certain results? Well, that's a really good question because a lot of the restrictions on voting, I mean, so the first argument for the restrictions on voting was voter fraud. There was a, this massive amount of voter fraud, and that's basically been disproven. So when that was disproven, they moved on to the second argument, which is that we're trying to protect the integrity of the and the interesting thing is that actually this has led people to distrust the elections and the integrity of the elections has gone down. Um, because as it becomes more difficult places to vote, people have less faith that their votes will be counted. And you combine that with the fact that uh, in 2016, uh, the Russians targeted 21 states' voter registration systems and in fact got a hold of voter registration data on a half a million people in Illinois has led to further distrust and now we have a situation where uh, in parts of 14 states and in five total states, you're voting on voting machines with no paper backups, and there's a lot of there's a lot of worry about that, and there's also a lot of conspiracies about what's what's happening. And so, um, I think like you know, taking steps to not make it harder to vote, uh, making it easier uh, for people to vote, would obviously be one thing we could do. I, I think you know, ensuring that every state um, has paper backups or votes on paper ballots, I think is really important. Um, that seems to be one of the major things that people are worried about. Um, right here in Pennsylvania, I mean, apparently they're gonna get new voting machines by 2020, but it's crazy that, you know, 2016 Pennsylvania was decided by 40 or 50,000 votes, and if the election was half, we might not even know about it because there's no paper receipts. One of the things I'm really concerned about right now is that in North Carolina, you just had a case where it seems like Republicans actually committed pretty blatant election fraud try to steal a congressional election there. And that's a fairly isolated incident. I don't want to make it seem like this happened in the country. This is a very unusual situation with some very sketchy dudes um, in rural North Carolina. But I'm very concerned that the evidence of Republicans committing election fraud will then be used by Republicans to then say, hey, there is evidence of fraud. It doesn't matter that we did it. 
It exists. And let's now make it hard, let's tighten the electoral system. When in fact, what went on in North Carolina was illegal under the law. That if you had just enforced the law in North Carolina, this would have been illegal. And the fact is Republicans turned a blind eye to it because it was benefiting their party. But I'm extremely concerned that this is then going to lead to people not having faith um, in the political process. Mark, is there any analytical data that shows what gives people more confidence in elections? I mean, partisanship is huge, in part because you know, our baseline model of public opinion is you follow your party leaders. And so when your party leaders are telling you one thing, you're probably going <laughs> to follow that. Um, I mean, I think objectively, though, I think one one caveat that should be applied to all this is we've become, we've become so much better at running elections in this country in the last 20 years that in the wake of Florida, we had a lot of... Except in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think in Florida, we you know, were doing better. And, and, and you know, Charles Stewart at MIT, uh, is a political scientist there, runs these uh, election indexes of how well states do. And on every objective measure that he collects, we're just doing so much better at running elections that uh, we can point to problems uh, and public perception issues, but we actually have a lot of hard data that we can sell the public on if we could only do it, that we're doing we're doing a really a really a much better job of doing this. And the reason we were able to find the election fraud in in North Carolina that appears to have happened was because they keep such good records and administer them so well that we were able to detect the, the, the things that happened. And so part of our challenge as I think political scientists, uh, those of us who, who work on elections, is gonna be to try to convey this this message to the public that's not gonna necessarily have the most uh, receptive here. Uh, sort of Donald Trump should tweet, we're running, running elections is better than ever. Yes. Mark's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. point about party leadership is really key. So I, I think, if I think about the very first free and fair presidential election in the history of this country, I think it was 1972. Uh, that was the first election in which adults over 18 could vote. It was also the second election after the Voting Rights Act, second national election after the Voting Rights Act. Um, and it was uh, the, uh, bu -bu 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 Let's see, what else was special about 72? Well, that was, that's pretty, I mean, you could argue that's 68. Georgia McGovern won one state. Well, no, the other thing, well, no, McGovern's key to this, because the primary process, at least on the Democratic side, was something close to Democratic. So even the winnowing process to select the nominee on the Democratic side, on uh, Democratic Party side, was Democratic and free and fair in that sense. It was, it was, it was much more uh, caucus and primary based and a lot less boss chosen, which is why you didn't get a Humphrey in 72, you got a McGovern which probably lost the election, but that's another thing, right? So, given all that, right, 72 is, you know, like it's a clean election, 76, clean election, right? <clears throat> not so long before that, right, 12 years earlier, 1960, that was not a free and fair election. There is good reason to believe that the state of Illinois should have gone to Nixon, but for Mayor Daley and his special powers, right? And yet we had a leader of the Republican Party, an incumbent vice president, who wanted so deeply in his heart to be president that later he committed major crimes to stay president. <laughs> he didn't even need to. He stood up and decided not to call the election fraudulent, even though he very well could have, yeah. right? And he said, no, we're gonna, we're gonna swallow it and just deal with it, and I'm gonna go win an election as governor of California, which didn't actually happen. And, and Kennedy got to be president, right? Basically on fraud. And, I mean, it's safe to say that he won Texas legitimately, but that was probably the only time Lyndon Johnson ran legitimately in the state of Texas. Well, that's, and, and that's a really important point, just to say one last thing about this, which is that when Donald Trump said uh, after the 2016 election that three million people voted illegally, a lot of people in the Republican Party said that wasn't true and spoke up. In the last election, you had the so-called respectable figures in the Republican Party, Marco Rubio, Paul Ryan, basically saying that the counting of ballots was somehow illegitimate. That when they were taking a little bit longer to count ballots and go to a recount in Florida, or when ballots were carefully being counted in California to make sure that people weren't disenfranchised, that that was somehow evidence of fraud. And so I think that basically Trump's lies have become mainstream within the Republican Party. And if that's the case, the normal election process, which we're doing better than ever in a lot of states, how are people gonna trust that? If Fox News says that the, a recount in Florida, which is just a normal thing, is somehow fraudulent, then of course people are gonna have uh, less faith in the electoral process. So I really, really worry about this because I think everything that we've seen in 2018, whether it's the suppression in Georgia, or whether it's raising doubts about the legitimacy of the election, it's all a test run for 2020. And so if you think it was bad now, just wait till two years. Yeah, I understand this is about elections, but let's stipulate 
that we run perfect elections. The question is, what are people really voting for? Yeah. And the last election I happened to be at the Democratic Convention where the pollsters were sort of presenting the data, substantial number of people, probably on both parties, and independent, feel that the system is rigged. And it seems to me that if you feel the system is rigged, you're not really that inclined to even participate, and you become much more alienated from the system. <coughs> My question, especially to Shiba, was it? Yeah, especially I since you live in the, the, I think, of the center of the birth of democracy, Orange County, where you had Madison and Jefferson and Monroe, who struggled with these ideas. What is your sense of what people expect from government? Because Madison and all these guys, they knew that emotions are something that needs to be contained. And certainly elections, with all the money that's poured into them and the expertise, is gonna target election emotions rather than what we can do as citizens to really make things happen. Two examples from the era before, you know, this election that you mentioned are one, the marijuana laws, and then the drug laws, where Nixon essentially decided to disenfranchise hippies and African Americans by pushing legislation that led to all the prisoners that now people are voting to, you know, re-franchise. The drug war has been totally destructive in communities, yet we don't really look at the processes that made that happen within our checks and balance system. So what can citizens do on juries? What can they do in terms of petitioning various different areas of centers of government so that they don't, they don't feel the system is rigged? because it is for the citizens that government is supposed to be uh, uh, instituted. Well, thank you for the kind words about um, Central Virginia, but I, I have friends from Athens, Greece, who might argue with the <laughs> idea that Central Virginia is where democracy was founded. Um, and my wife's from Austin, so she probably argues with that too. Um, so I think you answered your own question. The way that we um, push back against that level of cynicism is to perform our duties as citizens despite the evidence that it's a daunting, perhaps hopeless task. We have to take leaps of faith as citizens constantly. The very act of voting is a leap of faith, right? I voted in Texas for losers every two years, it seemed. <laughs> everyone was a leap of faith. And everyone was an exercise in a declaration that I'm part of this, right? I. Uh, but I, you know, and I, a lot of people do that, right? I mean, 40% of the people in Texas regularly vote for the loser and do so out of a sense of civic pride and obligation. Um, that's too few, but nonetheless, it's that notion that we, that it's okay to do the irrational, even if you think the system's rigged, it will only be unrigged if you take that leap of faith. If you connect with your federal citizens, and always you just say petition, argue, complain. The only thing that can ensure it will never be unrigged is to declare it rigged and go home. All right. So I think we have a bunch of people who want to ask questions. So now we do a round of a lot of people asking questions, and then we'll respond to them in, in unison. So let's start with here. Uh, yeah, we have the Oregon approach of, of mail-in uh, voting. We have. Other states where you know, two-week time frame, of course, Pennsylvania was in the dark ages. What do you, if you guys rule the world, what would, just to get the vote out, what would be the combination of things you would recommend to get people to vote? Like the mail-in ballot? What so let's gather a few more questions and we'll answer them all uh, directly. Uh, so let's go for this. Hi, um, thank you for coming to speak. Uh, so, for the U.S., which is a country that seems to pride itself on its political process as, flaws it, as flawed as it is, it seems that there is an astounding number of barriers to vote for essentially like, the majority of groups. Um, and especially working adults who, on voting day, still have to go to their jobs, and those tend to be in the middle of the week. So my question is, what is preventing the U.S. from instituting a voting day on the weekend, or if that's not possible, from having a national holiday, like a, like a voting day, um, that would encourage more citizens who aren't necessarily just there for the political process or aren't necessarily purely politically concerned to vote. 
Let's do one more up here and then we'll answer them better. My question had to do with, um, uh, now that the Democrats have taken back the House of Representatives, at least for the next two years, um, uh, what will be the GOP strategy? Because, uh, because the argument is that the GOP is now trying to consolidate its power in non-majoritarian institutions, particularly the district courts. Um, so my question is, is the GOP increasingly becoming an anti-majoritarian party, and what do you see happening in the near future? Let's grab one more question that I saw a hand in the back. In line with the gentleman's question, um, in North Carolina, Wisconsin, and Michigan, um, states that have majority of uh, Republican legislatures still, but now most of the um, uh, executives in those states are about to become Democrats, you see that they're passing last round of bills to, say, to strip away power from those incoming officials. And I'm wondering what exactly can be done about that, and what should we be doing outside of protesting, because it's very disturbing, and to me, it seems like they're deliberately thwarting the democratic process, and I'm not really sure how the modern Republican Party can say that that's okay, or at least stay silent. To not have any national figures like Paul Ryan or any of these other people say anything is just, it's shocking almost. So who are you, you man, so I'm you're sorry if you talked about that earlier. I wasn't here no for problem. the meeting. Yeah. 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 I did talk about it earlier, but I'm happy to uh, repeat it. I mean, I think the that there's the same questions. The answer is the same to the, the, the two questions, which is the GOP increasingly is devoted to minority rule. Uh, that basically they increasingly hold the views of the majority in contempt, and they're determined to rule even when a majority of people don't vote for that. And we see that with gerrymandering in a lot of the states with the blamed up power grabs, for example, uh, the Wisconsin legislature, uh, Republicans got 46% of the vote but 63% of seats in the Wisconsin legislature, which is how they were able to do a lame duck process in the first place. Um, I think public attention was really important. I think it might deter some people in the future. I also think a lot of these things are gonna end up in court and will eventually be struck down. North Carolina was the first state to do this kind of lame duck coup in 2016, and virtually everything they tried was struck down as unconstitutional. It's unfortunate it's gonna take that long, but I think a lot of the measures that they've passed uh, in, in places like Wisconsin will also be um, we're not constitutional. But I want to answer just the question about uh, mail-in voting. I, I would favor some sort of fusion system where you would have mail-in voting, but also you would have efforts to increase turnout in person on election day for those people that don't feel comfortable voting by the mail. Colorado does this really well, I think. Uh, Colorado has election day registration. Uh, they uh, will soon have, I believe, automatic registration. They also mail everyone a ballot. So uh, it's actually quite easy to, to, to vote in, in a place like that. Um, and I think that's the way it works. I think the Republican Party gave up on majoritarian rule at, in at least 2000. Uh, when it, I mean, Bush versus Gore is a classic document of anti-majoritarian rule. Uh, they decided to stop counting votes, and it was a 14th Amendment-based decision, uh, which the 14th Amendment is supposed to guarantee equal protection under the law. The victim of the lack of equal protection, bizarrely, was George W. Bush, not the voters of the state of Florida. Uh, you would think the 14th Amendment is supposed to protect. Um, so that was such a twisted, bizarre, weird, unjustifiable decision that the Supreme Court itself said this should not be used as precedent in any future decisions. Like, that's so intellectually bankrupt, I can't even start with it. No, I like their name. Exactly, right? So, I mean, everything was wrong. <laughs> Nonetheless, that's how we got a president for eight years. At least he got the majority of the votes four years later. But had John Kerry somehow got about 500,000 more votes in Ohio. John Kerry would have been president without a majority of the vote, of the popular vote. He would have won the Electoral College and not the popular vote. And then it would have been an interesting conversation among Republicans whether we should rethink this whole Electoral College thing. But in terms of the Saturday slash holiday question, um, the thing that is preventing us from having national elections on Saturday is the Constitution of the United States, <laughs> which says it has to be on Tuesday. That was intentional because my Neighbors, Madison, Jefferson, et cetera, decided that only people without, who don't need jobs should be able to vote. Uh, basically, white men uh, who are part of the landed gentry should be allowed to vote and encouraged to vote, and people who actually work for a living should not. A clear policy decision made to do that. Uh, it would take a constitutional amendment to move the national election to a Saturday. Uh, in Texas, many elections are on Saturdays. 
Um, turnout is higher when they are. It is better. Everyone agrees it's better if you actually care about voter turnout. Um, in terms of a holiday, I don't think that solves the problem for a couple of reasons. Holidays are great for bankers and almost no one else. Uh, bankers are public employees, really. But um, the problem with having a national holiday on a uh, on a, uh, an election day is that a lot of kids have to stay home, and that presents childcare problems to a lot of parents who otherwise have to go to work at places that don't help with childcare. They often don't have money to deal with childcare. Holidays, like snow days, are a disaster for parents who have to work at Walmart or 7-Eleven or in uh, canning plants with odd hours, which is the majority of Americans. Um, and the government shuts down on them. So right. if you're a vote by mail state, then the government's not doing mail. That's problematic. Yeah. That's why I just think every state should have two weeks of early voting. Mail. That's exactly it. So every day, day national, right. every day that is convenient for a Whatever that person's day off, that person can vote. That's the way to handle it. Can I just say like 30 seconds? I just want to say one last thing because we're in Pennsylvania. Um, despite all the attention to Georgia and Texas and other suppression states, Pennsylvania, like New York or Island, has some of the worst laws in the country. 37 states have early voting. Pennsylvania has no early voting. 30, 27 states have no excuse absentee ballots. Pennsylvania requires an excuse to get absentee ballot. 14 states have automatic voter registration. Pennsylvania has no automatic voter registration. 15 states have election day registration. Pennsylvania has no election day registration. The election was decided by 40,000 votes in this state in 2016. All evidence shows it's going to be as close in 2020. If you want to fix voting, don't go to Georgia, don't go to Texas, do it right here. That's my message to you guys. Do it right here. This state is going to help decide the next president, and the voting laws of this state are going to determine a lot of who the state votes for and how elections work here, period. Yeah, so that, that question about it, you know, what's, good, what's the agenda going to be? Most vote, voting rights stuff isn't going to be national. The Democrats will push this as their first bill, but there's no chance it will pass in the current. Congress, but you know, all, almost all voting rights policies said at the state or sometimes local level, and so you know, that's where you should be Well, and Republicans still have the Senate, which is all they care about because they can still get their objections. So. Great. Well, uh, thank you all for being a great audience. <laughs>